Hello, Pastor Ard and Cornerstone Baptist Church family. Greetings from Uganda. We are the Dan and Amy Dwyer family with Abby, Emily, and Eric here with us. Thank you for this opportunity for us to be part of your digital services during the special month of witnessing. I'm going to ask Amy to give out the questions that you had sent to us, and we'll try to answer them each one by one. Okay, so the first question was, what was the biggest culture shock when you first arrived on the field? Well, that's going back about 15 years, so it's a little bit of a challenge digging back out of our, our brains, but obviously there are always challenges that, that you face in changing to a new culture. And uh, some of the, the ones that stand out most in my mind would be uh, just the time that it takes to get anything accomplished. When we first arrived, uh, the immigration process was, I think, 17 rooms that a file had to fall, uh, pass through. And about six of those, either we or somebody on our behalf had to go and physically request the file if it was approved and then take it to the next room. Of course, it wasn't approved in the first room. You had to wait until they got to it, and then you could take it to the next room. So it took many visits to get immigration done, which is very much a necessity. Even paying the utility bills could take a couple hours to stand in line at the pay station just to pay one utility bill. It's gotten a lot better since then, but initially that delay took a lot of time. Even just to make a photocopy could take a couple hours uh, to wait for the machine to warm up and then power to be good enough and oh, we need to go buy paper or, or any number of delays just to get a photocopy made in town. I think the biggest challenge for us as a family came in the delay of getting our house ready. When we moved, we'd already paid rent uh, for the house, but when we arrived, uh, there was no tile on the floor. The floor wasn't finished. The walls weren't painted. Uh, some of the doors weren't yet finished. There were no kitchen cabinets. And so there was quite a bit of work yet to be done on the house. And so we spent our first 10 weeks staying with other missionary families, and we were ready to get into that house after 10 I'm weeks. sure they were ready to. <laughs> I think they were. Uh, but just the time that it takes is something that we've had to learn. We've had to learn patience, and we don't pray for it. Uh, I ask many times, Lord, just grant me patience. I don't want to have to learn it, but mm -hmm. uh, that never worked. Um, another area, though, of the, of the culture that was a big adjustment was learning how to interact with the people. Uh, Uganda is a very, I guess you would describe it as a polite society, and they will, they will often tell you what they think you want to hear rather than what they really believe to be true. Uh, to save face and to affirm others is often more important in their culture than giving out the truth. And so finding ways of, of discussing and conversing with the with the people here to find truth and to convey truth and not to be offensive in the way that we deal with things was a challenge as well. Okay, so question number two. What is your biggest need currently? Well, this is probably the same need that I always have, even if I don't always admit it. Uh, but our biggest need right now is probably wisdom. And uh, we're in the midst, as you know, of, of trying to purchase land for our church. And so organizing that whole process of purchasing land and then going forward towards construction. Right now that's all in a corona-shaped holding pattern and we're waiting for for these restrictions to lift so that we can uh, resume that process. We I'll, I'll say more about that later but uh, right now just navigating this process is something very new to me uh, and even ministering in these COVID conditions uh, pastoring itself is something that's new for me in the last few years, and God has taught me so much <laughs> through that. Um, I'm thankful that he's the one that's building his church, and I get to be his tool mm -hmm. instead of that burden being on me to build the church. But just seeing how God has brought our church together and is building up our local assembly is really wonderful to see. But we have a, a church people made up of of myriad cultures. We have about four different countries represented and from Uganda about 10 different tribes. So that cultural mix is something very different than what we dealt with in Sarodi where Pastor Ard visited us a few years ago. But part of this process then is mentoring church leaders. We are church planters with the desire of turning the ministry over to a group of qualified national leaders and that process of mentoring is something that uh, has to be unique for every church. There are some principles we can apply, 
but finding what's right to to work with the people in our church with the gifts God has given them and the opportunities that we have. So wisdom in those areas of ministry are, are a big part of where uh, we need wisdom right now. All right, so for question number three, uh, your question was, when you're home on furlough, what do you miss the most about your country? Then, when you're on the field, what do you miss the most about USA? So for this question, we're going to have our kids come and answer this one. So come on in, guys and girls. <laughs> well, uh, the thing that we mo miss the most when we're here is pretty much the same as we miss in America. We miss the people and the food. Well, first of all, for the food, when we're in America, we miss food here, which is beans or rice, which you guys know that. And then there's this Rolex, which is like, well, it's a thick chapati. Tortilla. A tortilla. Well, that's what they're called. And and then they fry an egg on top of that, which veg vegetables in it. And it's a Rolex. So in, in when, while we're here, we miss chilies and Chick-fil-A. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. When we're here in Uganda, we miss our family and our friends from in the States. And when we go back home for we miss our church family from Uganda as well as our missionary friends. All right. Thank you, kids. We'll let them escape. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So number, question number four. What is the most unexpected thing that you faced on the field upon arrival? Well, I know missionaries all have different stories of maybe different foods they had to eat or some, you know, very trying situation that they were in. To, to answer this question, the best thing I could come up with, it's not so much that God would use situations to build our faith, because he does that all the time, but the types of challenges that God would use to build our faith. Um, been fortunate in when we've been in the states we've always had reliable transportation but when we arrived on the field um, the budget that we had been recommended by other missionaries for a vehicle really wasn't adequate with the with what we had been told at the beginning of our deputation and part way through to when we actually arrived uh, I don't know if costs had gone up or if they were expecting that a different vehicle would be adequate but our budget limited what we could get and so we went a few months with a smaller car and then saved up and upgraded to a, an SUV which is more appropriate for the roads here because when we moved here the, the roads were just terrible mm -hmm. and uh, Amy will mention more about that in a minute but um, after the birth of, of Emily she was born about five months after we arrived and um, we we're driving back uh, up country about five hours up away from the capital city to where our area of ministry was and we got about an hour outside the capital city and the engine died. And this vehicle we had just bought, it was used, pretty much everything here is used from abroad, uh, but didn't even make it an hour out and the engine died. We called the mechanic from the, the dealer and he came and worked on it. And uh, it, it was the head gasket, the, 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 he the vehicle had overheated, the head gasket was spoiled and he brought the spare parts and the, the tools and everything he needed. And an hour after he arrived, we were test driving it, and he's been a friend ever since. Mm -hmm. He's made some good money off of us ever since, but uh, he's been a friend. And, other and, yes. and many other issues after that. But. Because that vehicle, every time we had it for 13 months, and every trip to the capital city, which, which at that time was monthly. at least once a month for immigration or to get our monthly support, um, we broke down either going or coming back or both all but one trip. And, uh, but in all of that, and, and I could tell you more stories about God's provision and protection, but we never broke down in an unsafe place and we were always able to get somebody to help us. And, uh, Lord really, really built our faith because I'm not a mechanic. Uh, I, even if I were getting the tools and spare parts isn't practical in many of the settings where we were. And God really built our faith to show us that he's trustworthy to protect us. When Dan had mentioned that Emily was born five months after we arrived in Uganda and um, we had gone down to the capital city because at that time we were living about five hours. Mm -hmm. Now it takes about six hours, but five hours from the capital. 
And so we went down a few weeks early before the due date just because we didn't know if she's going to come early or what. So um, the road down, though, to the capital city was very, very bad and full of potholes. And I just remember being so uncomfortable already. And then, you know, the vehicle having to swerve here and there to avoid all the potholes or drive down into them. Mm -hmm. That was the case many times. Um, But then once we got down to the capital city and we were there just about a week, I guess, Mm -hmm. I started feeling really sick and didn't know what was wrong. So we went and saw the doctor and found out I had malaria. I guess we were up, we were down there two weeks by that mm-hmm. time because we had gotten bit while we were down there. Um, and so um, then having malaria on top of about ready to you know deliver Emily, it was quite a challenge. But the Lord was so good through it all. And um, yeah, it's it's amazing to see what God has done and how he protects and has provided and sometimes we didn't know how but he always he's always faithful and he's always done it and though both amy and i have had malaria once or twice our kids in 15 years our kids have never uh tested positive for malaria and that's just the lord's protection and just to see how he he's faithful and uh, we can trust him so the types of challenges that God has brought to build our faith, I think, would be the most unexpected things. Wow, Lord, you're, you're bringing that? But he knows what he's doing, and, and he's taught us what we've needed to learn uh, to trust him more in each situation. Mm-hmm. So question number five, then, is how is the pandemic of coronavirus affecting your country? Are you able to get the supplies you need? Are your church members affected by it? Questions like that that you asked. So I'm going to take those one at a time. First, how is the pandemic affecting your country? Well, the most noticeable things is that the roads are empty, probably much like it is in the States. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot more places to get hand sanitizer and to wash your hands before you enter a building. Uh, It's amazing how many people discovered this concept of hand washing during this coronavirus. (laughs) It's great. Uh, But that's one of the, the most noticeable things here. But the way it's impacting us more is... Uh, for about three weeks now, there's been no public transportation allowed in the country. Uh, the borders are closed, the airport's closed, all the buses, taxis, uh, even private, trans- private uh, small uh, vehicle um, for public transportation like an Uber has been shut down. Um, and since then, they've, they've canceled even the private transportation. We were able to move up to three people at a time in a vehicle. But now even even with our family, that was limited. But now we can't move at all for two weeks. And so that's limited things. Much like in the States, then uh, there's a limit on public gatherings, specifically worship services for churches and other organizations have been canceled because they're trying to stop the spread of the virus. And so because of that, we've also moved our services online and uh, we're interacting through social media Uh, In fact, no gatherings of any type of more than five people are supposed to be allowed. That's supposed to is an important clause in that in that uh, statement, because we see people often gathered in 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 front of shops or in different places playing games or children playing sports or other things still happening. But we're not supposed to be together in groups of more than five outside of a family home, um, which is good because we know families with more than five. Uh, But even if you do move out on foot, which is really the the only way that we have to move around, there is an overnight, um, uh, what do they call that? Overnight uh, um, curfew between 7 p.m. and 6.30 a.m. So nobody's supposed to be on the streets except the security personnel during that time. The next part of that question is, are you able to get the supplies that you need? And and for the most part, very much so. Um, The utilities have still been working. And we've got produce markets within walking distance of our home, including right across the street from our church, though that's a very different view. Uh, Every Friday, there's a big public market at our church just across from the church building. And I don't know, thousands of people probably come throughout the day. Uh, Vendors come and set up temporary little kiosks or put a tarp on the ground and sell used clothes or whatever they have. Uh, But right now, the streets are just empty. There's nothing going on there. And even at the little vegetable market, uh, they've got a rope stretched around it. You can't pass that rope until you've sanitized your hands, and then you can go in to buy the produce. So they are are trying to control that. Uh, We also have a large supermarket about a mile away, another direction, 
um, and that has continued to remain open so we can get um, other essentials beyond fresh produce. We can even still buy toilet paper, so that's mm -hmm. a blessing. Uh, hand soap, toilet paper, all of those things are still fairly readily available. And within walking distance. And within walking mm -hmm. distance, which is very much a blessing. Then lastly, are your church members affected by it? Of course, the food uh, sustainability is one concern, um, but most of the people are off of work for now. Um, some are working from home, but not very many. But like in the States, many of them will resume work once this, re these restrictions are lifted. In the meantime, their challenge would probably come with paying their rent, maybe some of the utilities. Their food, they probably have something that they can get by, uh, but the rent and utilities would be more of an issue. In Uganda, my understanding is that landlords typically cannot evict somebody until their non-payment has gone beyond three months. I don't expect this to affect people that long, so they probably won't be at risk there unless they were already behind. The self-employed, we do have a few self-employed people in our church. It's going to affect them the most with lack of income during this time. Uh, others are working for international organizations or for government agencies, and so I would assume that their salaries would still uh, at least partially be there to some degree. Uh, during this past weekend, the government announced that schools are expected to resume on the 27th of this month, and other businesses will begin opening on the 20th unless conditions worsen with the coronavirus. And so, except businesses that depend on tourism, then I think things will begin to come back to, to normalcy by the end of the month. But the borders and the airports are closed through the first part of May, and so anyone in that sector will, will still have some issues. But for the most part, our church people have been fairly resilient, uh, been encouraged by the yeah. feedback that we're getting okay. from them, the things they're posting on social media. One of the most exciting things for me as a pastor is when I see one of our church members responding to somebody else with scripture to say, we don't have to fear, we have hope in Christ because of this and this, and disputing these rumors of fear. Instead of sending them to their pastor, they're able to share the word of God and give hope to others. And so it's affecting our church members, but I'm excited to see how God's using it to build their faith as well. Now you also ask, what methods have you found to be effective in connecting with both members and visitors in the church? Well, when we were up in Sarodi, where we lived before, it was much more of a rural setting. Though we were in town, the, the attitude was more of a village attitude. Now we're back in the capital city in the metro area, and the urban attitude is much different from that of the village. Uh, our neighbor, uh, meet it neighbor, we've probably met her three times, and not from lack of effort, but she, like many people, leave home around six or seven in the morning, and they get home around nine or ten at night. People work six days a week, seven days a week, and uh, their interaction is more you know, through their phone. And so we've had the best response when we initiate follow-up to visitors to our church via text messaging. And so during this time of lockdown, uh, we continue to interact via social media, through phone calls, and through text messages. And that has helped us to be able to stay in contact both with our members as well as with those that have visited the church. And we've found that our church members are not only watching our online services and participating in our church member group chats, but they're also sharing the service video links uh, with people in their circle of social media friends and using it as an opportunity to expand the ministry of the church rather than just reducing our ministry because we can't meet together. And so this has caused us to look at ways that we can continue to record our services to post on social media even once we're able to return meeting together in person again. Like, for example, some of the ladies in our church whose husbands are not saved, mm -hmm. it, when they're playing the services at home, then it's, you know, bringing the gospel, you know, reiterating it in her home other than what their wife is already witnessing in ways that she's witnessing. So. And as they post yeah. things on social media, mm -hmm. co-workers and other people that might not listen to them otherwise or yeah. might not accept a, a, a spiritual message are much more open to it at a time like this. Another question you asked is, is social distancing harder on the culture, on the field, than, we, than what you experience in America? Well, the answer to that is yes and no. <laughs> um, up country, people live almost entirely outside their homes. Uh, a typical house in the village would be a 10 by 10 foot room uh, with either corrugated metal or a grass thatched roof. 
And by the time you put a bed in there for two people and some storage, you know, cubicles, there's really not much room in there. They basically sleep in there and maybe change clothes in there and use it as a storage room. Everything else they do outside, they brush their teeth outside, they cook outside, they eat outside. Everything is done outside. Um, so social distancing is something kind of an oddity in that sense. Now they usually have a garden and there are shops within walking distance that would have produce and other basic essentials. Uh, so most days, village residents tend not to travel very far, uh, but they do usually socialize with the people in their immediate village, and often those are people to whom they're related. Uh, the, the clan and the family pass down the inheritance of the land, and so as the sons marry, they bring their wives and they live in that same village that they grew up in many times. So the social interaction there does run strong, so social distancing probably not effective in the village, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they're not being exposed to people outside their village as often. And so that social isolation from distant uh, influences would be more the norm. Uh, for those in an urban setting, the village mindset of community and interaction still affects their activities. But because of their work schedules, they don't have that social interaction as often as maybe they would desire or, or, or make time for. Uh, but still during this time, we see several people crowded together, as I mentioned, playing games or doing other things. Uh, probably the area where it affects them the most deeply would be the restrictions on funerals. Because of the social interaction of, of the family unit and the connection that they have by having land in the village where they grew up, and, and they have land. to have a village home where they will be buried one day. And so that connection to, to extended family runs very deep. We had a gentleman in our church whose paternal grandmother passed away this past weekend. And because of the travel ban, he's not able to go. It's about 150 miles up to the village where she lives. And he's not able to go for that funeral. And so that is something that would affect them. Probably the hardest emotional toll of the social distancing would be the inability to be part of those important family events. Another question is, has your financial support been sustained or have you experienced a dip in giving from your supporting churches? Well, there's always fluctuations from month to month in our, in our support, mm -hmm. uh, but March was within that normal range of fluctuations. Uh, usually whatever comes in in March, many times it's what's been given in churches during the month of February or early March. And so that may not be showing any effect from people uh, being out of work or, or from panic buying or whatever it may be. I'm not sure. Uh, we don't know what will happen over the next few months, but we did purchase some extra supplies in case things were limited here. And so we do have some additional supplies on hand. And we've also been able to cut back on some expenses right now mm -hmm. with this uncertainty of what's going to come ahead in case there is a dip in our incoming funds. Then have you experienced a greater freedom and openness in sharing the gospel during the pandemic? Are people searching for peace and comfort? Well, the short answer is yes, uh, but I tend not to usually give short answers very often, so I'll give you the full <laughs> answer. Uh, every event is an opportunity, and, and I try to keep that mindset when I look at things. Even, even delays, if it takes me two hours to pay a utility bill, God put me there with other people for those two hours. Of course, right now, we're six feet apart from everybody, <laughs> but, um, but whatever, oppor whatever event there is, uh, it's an opportunity. And one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 118, 24. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Just today I was walking back. I'd bought some uh, bananas and carrots at the market. And uh, I tried to greet our neighbors as we bought, walked by. And I asked, you know, I said, good afternoon. And they said, no, it's not good. And I said, no, it's the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and just try to keep people's focus back on the Lord. Uh, but uh, that, that mindset that God made today. And uh, it, it's, it's something that we can share with people. And I pair that with, with uh, 2 Timothy 1.7. I've mentioned that over and over to our church family. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Those are rare these days on television. Mm -hmm. I don't, we, don't watch, we don't have TV here, but just the news reports that we get and what people post on social media, 
a uh, sound mind is a is a luxury, but God has given it to us, and I'm thankful for it. But we have had people ask us, are, are you worried about this coronavirus? Are, are, are you scared? And that does give us opportunities. Mm-hmm. There was um, just about two weeks ago, I was walking home from church, and this was after we weren't allowed to drive anywhere, but we're only a mile, about a mile from church. So mm-hmm. I was walking home, and I normally go a, a certain way, but for some reason, I just felt the Lord wanted me to go a different path. And so... Um, Towards the end of where I was going before I had to turn to go onto our road, there was a lady um, who was outside her house with her children, and she saw me walking uh, past, and she she said, aren't you afraid, and aren't you scared of all this coronavirus? And I said, well, I try to be cautious and careful, but I'm really not afraid because I know that the Lord has a, is in control, that he has a purpose for all this, and and so I was able to share the gospel with her a little bit and then try to encourage her and help her to see that even if we did fear, what good would it do? You know, we, we need to trust the Lord. And so it was a good reminder to her. And she's like, yeah, thank you. Yes, you're right. I really do need to trust the Lord. So it was just a little way that, you know, we can use our faith to encourage others. We have a few security guards that attend our church and one of them, I... I was talking with him and one of his colleagues and I asked him how they were doing. He said, he was fine, but he said, my friend here is not okay. He's worried. And uh, that's somebody we've been praying for that he would get saved and Mm -hmm. have that opportunity again to show why we have hope. Even if we get the coronavirus, even if we die from the coronavirus, this, this life is temporary and God has something much more for us. We already have eternal life and uh, we can live in that joy. Uh, I mentioned earlier, it's been encouraging to see our church members posting words of faith on their social media statuses and sharing it with others. And it has given more of that freedom, more of a reception to that message. Uganda tends to be open and and welcoming generally to religious messages. Discernment isn't always there, but they tend to be receptive to them. Uh, In fact, most um, religious media right now is talking about how we're in the midst of the tribulation. We had locusts, and now we're having pestilence, and so this is the tribulation. And and uh, I was encouraged today. I got a phone call from the station manager of our radio station up country um, that that serves the Sarodi area where we used to to live. And a he was telling, yeah, it's a high Muslim area, but but because they their coverage area is probably between eight and ten million people that live in their in their coverage area and uh, they get a lot of interaction from people but he said most of the most of the media houses up there are just talking about uh, fear if you watch television or or tune into the others they don't have an answer they just have they just report on the problem and he said, for us, our you know, Pastor Basolo is on the air every service time, and he's preaching the message of hope that this this could bring death, but Jesus Christ came to give us life. And they said the response they've been getting from listeners has been great. Just yesterday, they had a man call in from you know, several hours away. He said, I've been listening to this radio station for a week, and I wanted you to know I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, and as soon as we can travel, I want to come so that I can get involved in the church. And and just different messages that they're getting of people calling in with questions. And he said, our phones have been so busy because we can't go to people in person. So there has been a much greater openness, and the radio station has been very effective in finding listening ears and open hearts. Really, because that's what people have time. They do. Especially in the villages. They sit around, and they talk, and they listen. And Yeah, radio is just so effective and that's the way to reach into the homes mm-hmm. right now and because in the villages a lot of them don't really have internet access so the radio is doing you know god's using it in amazing ways so i think this is our last question it right is. okay so can you give us an update on your ministry and the developments with your need for a larger building well i have to begin by saying thank you very much for your participation in that Uh, Your check has been received at BIMI and deposited into an account that we're holding for that time when we're going to purchase land. So thank you for your generosity. Mm -hmm. And to to bring that full circle, uh, on the 25th of March 
we got uh, confirmation from BIMI that all of the funds that were lacking for us to be able to purchase the land that we had been offered had come into BIMI and that's now in funds available to us. So how God brought, you know, eighty to ninety thousand dollars into our accounts in less than a month on the cusp of, of the worst financial crisis of our lifetimes, at least so far. Uh, but that's something only God can do. And I can't explain it except to say that we've said all along that we know who owns the land. Mm -hmm. We just don't know how he's going to transfer the title to us. And we've seen God yeah, provide. Anyway. Yeah, because it still <laughs> is either way. He's just going to transfer from one human owner to, to our church as the owner. And so two days after we got that confirmation, I called the attorney that's been helping us and our pastoral leadership team from our church. And I also asked uh, representatives from three other families in our church who own their own homes uh, to come. And two of them were able to come and participate in this meeting. Um, that's when we could still drive personal vehicles. And uh, we met at the church and I asked the attorney to take our church members out to, uh, to view that land. I didn't go with them. None of the Americans went because we don't want to undermine the negotiation process, but he took them out to view that land to get their feedback on it before we purchased. We had not discussed uh, the specifics of what land we're looking at with the church because if we did and then we didn't get funding, it could cause some distrust among some people not understanding, well, I thought we were buying this land, but then now it's been sold to somebody else. And we didn't want to bring confusion. So now we brought them in and, and uh, in that meeting, we gave the attorney the go ahead to move forward in this process towards the purchase of land. And so that next step would be for him to go and validate uh, the offer, which would be uncovering the boundary markers for that land, bringing out the surveyors to verify the seller's identity. He told stories of how you pull the land title and there's the photo of the owner and fraudsters will hire people who look like that person to come and stand in as the owner just to try to get money. And so he said, I've seen all the tricks. Hmm. And uh, I'm thankful that we have uh, somebody who who has a relationship with the Lord to to yes. help us in this. Mm -hmm. uh, but he'll verify the seller's identity and verify the legitimacy of the land title documents, confirm that there are no court cases which would hinder the transfer of the title, and then uh, other investigative work to make sure we're not being conned in this process. He's also looking at another property that's even closer to our church and about the same size that we've that we have noticed uh, in this process, and he's gonna begin that process of looking at that land in case the one that we've been looking at turns out to not be authentic. But uh, uh, after the purchase, then the next step will be a security wall around the property, and while the title is being processed and the transfer to our church name, and then only after we have the title in hand will we begin construction. And of course, we'll need you know the money to do that as well, but. I believe God that can, can provide the construction funds through our church membership uh, right now in our church bank account through the giving of our church. And this is all in, in really less than a year, about nine months. Um, we renovated the, the space that we have now, and that pretty much used the, all of our church funds in reserve. But since that time, we've been able to build up and we have enough for our next quarterly rent payment, which isn't due till June. And on top of that, we still have the equivalent of about $1,000 US in our bank account, separate from what we've set aside for the missions projects that we have ongoing. And I've been really excited to see how God has provided through our church family. And uh, with the current economic crisis, actually the dollar has strengthened against the Ugandan shilling. And so I'm praying that we'll be able to purchase the land, put up the perimeter wall fence, and develop and get the building plans approved with our current funds and then see how God is going to provide through our church membership. All right. So I think you have your devotional. So I do want to thank you for your faithful prayers for us and your support. Um, it's just amazing. And I'm glad that we are partners in this because there's no way we could do it alone. Yeah. And so we thank you and thank you for your time listening and thank you for your desire to hear what's going on here in Uganda. So Dan, I'll let you do your devotional. Right, thank thank you. you.
Well, as I was studying this week leading up to Easter, I don't know which week you'll be viewing this there in Missouri City, but it's the week leading up to Easter here, and I was studying in Mark 16. I just want to share a few things that the Lord brought to my attention here. In Mark 16, uh, we see uh, what I'm calling the messengers to the apostles. And in Mark 16, we see that Mary Magdalene, actually when she got to the tomb, the angel told her, he's not here for he's risen. Go and tell the disciples that he's risen. Well, when she saw Jesus standing by later, she didn't realize who he was. She still had doubts in her mind, but then she went and told the disciples, Jesus is risen. And we see in verse 11, and they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. Now this is somebody that had been, that had been, had her life transformed before Jesus called the other apostles. She's somebody that had been bound by demons that Jesus set free. What a great testimony of God's power. And each of the apostles had testimonies, but Mary was somebody that they should have trusted by now, but they believed her not. Well, as we go on down, there were the, the two walking on the road to Emmaus and uh, in verses 12 and 13. And they went and told it unto the residue, the other believers, the other apostles in that group as well. Neither believed they them. And it wasn't until verse 14, afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Of course, we know Thomas wasn't there in the first instance. He came later. And often we, we, we kind of challenge Thomas for his lack of faith. But the reality is, when we think about it, Thomas wasn't so wrong. He wanted to see his Savior. Uh, but the, the, the apostles, the disciples here, their eyes were on their dilemma. The master, the teacher we've been following for these three years, he's died. He's dead. Their eyes were on the, the dilemma instead of on their deliverer. Their eyes were on their situation instead of their Savior. I wonder how often we do that. Right now, the world is focused on a situation. It's focused on a dilemma. It's focused on this virus. You cannot read any news or watch any news or listen to the radio from very long at all without hearing something about the coronavirus, COVID-19, lockdowns, shutdowns. And what happens is we get our eyes and we, we focus on the recession instead of on our Redeemer. We fret over our finances instead of increasing our faith in our Father. We follow the stock market devaluation instead of following the Spirit's direction. Because it's interesting to me, in verse 14, He upbraided them because of their unbelief. But immediately after that happened, the very next verse, 15, And He said unto them, Go. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The whole context of Jesus appearing to them and challenging them and then sending them, it all comes back to faith. There's a reason we named our church Faith Baptist Church. We want to keep that in the forefront of our minds. And perhaps a lot of it's because God has done so much for my own faith through this process. But here the apostles, really the problem that they had was a lack of faith. And now Jesus is telling them to go. More than any other period in our lifetimes, the entire world is realizing the truth of Psalm 103, verses 15 and 16. I love this psalm. There are many wonderful, encouraging, uplifting psalms. But notice what he says here in Psalm 103, 15 and 16. As for man, his days are as grass. As the flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it's gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. And that's our world today. Several countries digging mass graves for nameless people, unrecorded, buried. And the place thereof shall know it no more. Our days are as grass. The wind passeth over it and it's gone. This is the world that we live in. My mind is drawn to Isaiah 45, 22, where God says, Look unto me 
and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. People have put their faith, they put their hope, their confidence, their trust in many things in recent years and decades. But I believe God is saying, look to me. Look to me, all the ends of the earth, and be ye saved. For I am God. There is none else. Hey, what's the God that we've put in our life in front of him? There is none else. But we have different priorities. People around the world have had different priorities that appeal to the life of the flesh. Appeal to the temporary instead of the eternal. And he's saying, hey, I want you to look to me. We have that opportunity. People have realized that life is short. Life is frail. Life is like a flower that the wind passes over and it's gone. The place thereof shall know it no more. But the psalm doesn't end there. The very next verse is the hope that we have that we can give. It says, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. Hey, as we are interacting with people during this coronavirus, people are afraid. People are realizing the frailty of life. But that's this physical life. There is a God who has given us an eternal life, who has mercy, which is from everlasting to everlasting. Are we giving that hope? The problem that we have many times is our faith. What's our focus on? Are we focusing on this virus? Or are we focusing on the one who has victory over sin and death? We have a redeemer, we have a deliverer, we have a hope because of Jesus Christ. Are we sharing that with others? Thank you so much for this opportunity to, to minister to you as you have ministered to us so many times. Your church and your pastor and his family have been a blessing to us coming to visit us a few years ago. And uh, we're so thankful for Cornerstone Baptist Church and what God is using you to do to minister there in the Houston area. And we covet your prayers as we continue to pray for you. We're praying as, as God is guiding you in uh, leading you to new staff and, and other changes there in this corona time. And uh, thank you for being a part of our ministry and for allowing us to be a part of your church. God bless you. Have a good day.